Hello, and thank you for joining this online presentation about modern British marine life. Um, those of you who've been lucky enough to visit the Etches collection will undoubtedly have seen the amazing wonders that our seas had back in the Jurassic. Um, sadly, I can't compete with those amazing marine reptiles, um, such as, you know, the ichthyosaurs, pleosaurs, pliosaurs, that sort of thing. However, actually, there are a lot of the modern inhabitants of British seas that had very close relatives back in those times. So hopefully for those that know the Etches collection well, you'll see some good parallels, some modern examples of some of the species that or some of the, the types of groups that you've seen in the collection. In fact, there's a shrimp in this talk that I took about an hour after leaving the collection and driving down to, to the beach in Swanage. Um, actually, the Dorset coast is a wonderful place to explore and to meet the modern marine life of British seas. Just down the hill from the, the museum, you'll find yourself down in Kimmeridge Bay. It's a fantastic rock pooling, snorkeling and diving location where you can see many of these incredible creatures. And I think we're very lucky with the richness that we have around British seas. As a nation, we're also fortunate that within well, every single person in this country lives within 70 miles of the sea and 22 million of us live within five miles of the sea. Um, yet we don't necessarily get to know the species there as well as we should. And I hope that this talk encourages you all to, to get to know it. So rather than see me big all the way through it, I'm going to shrink myself down and appear now down in the corner of the frame um, so you can see my, my pictures nice and big, which is, is far nicer than looking at a picture of me. So um, my title for this talk is Amazing Modern British Seas, and I hope to run you through a small selection of the characters that we have living below the surface in our own waters. I think a lot of us in, in the British public, we're more used to knowing something about the marine life of overseas, because that's what we tend to see in, in, in particularly in, in TV documentaries. So hopefully tonight I give you a little bit more insight into what's below the surface in our own country. I think a lot of us, we tend to have the view that the British seas are, are dark, murky and, and not full of life. And actually, um, throughout most of the UK, that's that's really most misleading. Our seas are can be you know bright and clear and packed with life. Um, there are more than um, well, there's 8,365 species have been described in the UK from our seas. I can't possibly cover them all tonight, but I hope this talk gives you something of an overview. Also, there's definitely a preconception that a lot of our marine life is drab and not exciting to look at. And I think the truth again is, is very different from that. There is incredible richness of color. This is a tiny species of sea slug called Edmundsella. Um, there is, even amongst the fish, there is real brightness and color, particularly in the spring when a lot of fish are in their mating colors. Um, it really can be as pretty as any of the fish that we can see overseas. This is a, a male Ballon Ras showing off a really gaudy coloration um, outside of Plymouth. We have also some easy to appreciate dramatic special species. Um, this is a young grey seal pup up in Lundy Island. And of course we have the real A-list celebrity species. The UK or British Isles is undoubtedly the best place in the world to see this most amazing fish, the second largest fish in the world, the basking shark. And I photographed this one here down in, in just outside of Penzance in Cornwall. But we don't necessarily need to be to go underwater to appreciate marine life. A stroll on the beach, a, a dip, a look into rock pools can, can reveal some really incredible creatures and allow us to get to know some of the species we share this country with a little bit better. If we're a little bit more adventurous, we can go for a snorkel and enjoy the waters, particularly in the, in the in the summer months. You know, any sort of wetsuit can make you very comfortable for really quite a long period of time in the water and give you the chance to, to really see fantastic species all around our coasts. And for those a little bit more adventurous still, um, getting into scuba diving can really give you an up close, detailed and personal view with these species and enjoy the wonders of our, our seas. When we first dip our heads below the surface, we're usually met in the UK with seaweeds. And seaweeds, for me, they're, they're a fascinating group. 
And I think we tend to take them a little bit for granted. And I love their richness. I, I love the parallels that I see, although seaweeds are very basic types of, of plant. The parallels I see with the plants that, that I that grow in my garden. Um, many seaweeds are, are quite perennial in that they die back a lot in the winter. Um, and then they grow with a burst in the spring. Then later in the year, they tend to get over colonized and a little bit drowned in as, as more and more life grows on top of them. It's a fascinating process to see throughout the year. The whole food chain is, is starts with the sun and, and seaweeds dominate the shallow waters around our coast because they're reliant on that sunlight coming down through the water and powering them through photosynthesis. Um, but as you can see already from these two pictures, they come in many different shapes and forms and it's fascinating to get to know them. That photosynthesis then provides a food source for lots and lots of animals and particularly invertebrate animals, um, mollusks and crustaceans um, and um, echinoderms, um, which are the starfish and, and particularly the, the sea urchins, um, are real grazers of the, the seaweeds. Um, and whereas on land, I think we, we tend to think of, of herbivores as being, you know, cows and sheep and rabbits and that sort of thing. And there are herbivorous um, vertebrate animals underwater, but actually a lot of the herbivory that's going on in the shallows of our seas is actually through invertebrate animals. And that's something you can also relate to when you, you look around the, the etches collection. A lot of invertebrates fossilize very nicely, and it's really interesting to see those. And many of those may well have been performing um, herbivorous roles in those ecosystems. Um, back to the seaweeds, they come in a variety of, of different forms. I'm not going to run through all of these, but you've got long stringy ones. These are actually two different types. We've got uh, mermaid tresses here and, and also spaghetti weed. Um, we've got the, 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 the kind of the shorter branching fingery like ones, which are the racks. Um, and then we've got the bigger sort of army wavy um, kelp, kelp, kelp like ones. So actually, as you get to know the seaweed forest, you quickly realize there's actually a whole variety of shapes and textures and colors. There's reds and yellows and browns and greens all mixed together in there. And actually, the more you stare into this world, the more fascinating it becomes. And it's something that we can enjoy even without going underwater, because obviously many of these species are exposed at, at low tide. The different types of seaweed also provide great habitat for different types of creatures. This cuttlefish, for example, this is a male cuttlefish, but um, this cuttlefish um, really likes, um, the, the cuttlefish really likes spawning around this sea oak, um, which is this particular seaweed here. Um, whereas here, these, these, this, this thongweed um, is attracted this school of, um, of, of um, oh, I've forgotten their name, um, the, um, um, the sand eels. Whereas here, a, a large kelp with, with really big, this is a furs below, it's one of the largest kelp species we have in the UK. Um, here, these new leaves have provided a habitat for this tiny nudibranch up in, up in Scotland. Perhaps the most amazing sea, seaweed community in the UK waters, though, are the kelp forests. And um, as you go a little bit into a little bit deeper, sort of, you know, you see the tops of them as a snorkeler. But as you can dive down into them, um, this really is a magical world um, and incredibly important species. Our, our main species of kelp, um, sometimes called QV, um, but it's sort of forest kelp that builds these forests. Um, has actually been found by scientists to support 389 different species of life, all clinging to it, growing on it, feeding on it, interacting with it in different ways. Um, you know, really fascinating species. It's not as big as the giant kelp that you might have seen photos of from, from say, California, um, but it still creates a forest environment and you can dip down into this world and pick your way through it, although it tends to grow so thickly that it's actually quite difficult as a diver to swim through between these, these stems, these, these, um, these stipes that grow up from the seabed. But for the marine life, it's a fantastic environment, a three-dimensional environment. The top has a lot of water movement, um, plenty of food being brought there. Underneath, it's much more protected, both from predators and a much calmer environment in, in rougher conditions. This is a, a sea toad, a type of spider crab, climbing up through up to the canopy. Um, I actually don't know if, if grey seals are one of those 389 species that, that live, uh, are known to live in, in kelp, but they certainly do enjoy this environment. 
Um, I don't know if they're part of the, 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 the species count. Um, there's actually three gray seals in this picture. There's one in the foreground. And if you trace your way back, you'll see there's another couple in the background. This is in the Farne Islands off, off the Northumberland coast. As the season goes on, though, the kelp forest really changes as more and more clone um, colonizing species um, end up there. You get schools of fish hanging around this environment. More and more different types of seaweed grow on top of the kelp. Um, there's sea mats as well, which are kind of a, a bryozoan. It's an it's a encrusting animal that, that will coat the kelp. Um, and it's a filter feeding animal. And, and over the season, obviously, with all this growing on top of the plants, the kelp itself is, is losing its ability to photosynthesize, but providing a habitat for all these species. And the way the kelp deals with this is during the winter, many of these blades are shed, um, knocked off in winter storms, which is why often in the winter you'll see a lot of seaweed washed up on the beach. It's a bit like just the, 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 you know, the leaves that we shuffle our feet through in the forest. Um, but here they, they rip, they're ripped away by the winter storms right um, and grow through. If they don't rip off, the kelp will actually regrow a new blade. So the old blades are at the top and a new blade will grow underneath and eventually will shed the, the old blade. So there's fresh, clean um, leaf surface or frond surface available for new growth in the ne next year. Um, not all shallow waters, though, are dominated by seaweeds. Um, the seagrass um, habitat is a really important one in the UK. Actually, it's not a, a great story. Um, in that over the last hundred years, we've actually lost 92% of our seagrass that used to cover inshore areas in the UK. But people are really starting to become aware of that now. And there's real efforts being made to transplant, to put seagrass, to collect and disperse seagrass seeds and try and restore this, these really important shallow water meadows that are home to lots of different species are utilizing this as a food source. And in fact, one of our um, or a couple of our most exciting species that we have in the UK, particularly along the south coast, this is a, a spiny seahorse, one of the two seahorse species we have in the UK that like this type of environment that seagrass also favours. Um, there are plenty of other types of underwater habitat um, in the shallows, but another um, photosynthetic one that I'll draw attention to is merle, and merle is a very strange type of plant in that it's dominated by a, a calcareous, a, a brittle, um, stony, limestoney um, skeleton. Um, and, it and it grows in these pink masses. And this one here is not only covering the seabed. This is in Loch Sween up in Scotland. It completely covers the seabed, these pink nodules growing across the seabed. But it's also then been colonized by a huge amount of other life. There's a, there's a, a shore crab. Um, crawling around on this. And then in the background, um, these are all brittle stars um, creating a bed on the seabed. Um, this area has quite strong currents and the brittle stars gang together like this because if they're living on their own, they'd easily get washed away. But they live together in these big groups so that when the current is running strongly, they can all link arms and sort of become almost like a super organism protecting themselves in these strong currenty environments. As we drop deeper below the seaweed layer, so we come to the area that's dominated by animal life. And I think one of the things you need to get used to as you first explore the underwater world is that animals come in far more shapes and forms and colours than we're used to thinking about animals on land. And a lot of the animals that live underwater don't actually move for a lot of their life. Living in a, a soup of food, they can, can, can live their lives attached to the seabed um, not worry about walking around, moving around themselves and allow the food to wash over them, the water to wash over them and bring them their nutrition. So here we have a mix of, of soft corals and there's some sea urchins in here. The sea urchins are, are herbivores going up and feeding on the kelp above and the soft corals are, are there waiting for the, the current to start up and then they'll open up their polyps so they can feed. This is in, in St Abbs Marine Reserve up in Scotland. So as we drop below that kelp layer, so the animal world takes over, and particularly if you get into scuba diving, this is where the real colour comes in. We go from those greens and browns and reds and yellows of the seaweed zone down into these richer colours um, below there. And, and really the seaweed just runs out because there's no longer enough light for it to grow. So down below that, the animals just take over. And you can see in this picture, there's a very often a very sharp dividing line between the depth at which seaweeds can no longer grow. And suddenly here come the, the, the animal life. It's a little bit like if you, you know, if you've climbed a high mountain, you'll walk up through um, a, a layer of trees 
and then you get to a layer where the trees can no longer grow. It's a little bit like reverse going underwater. And mixed in this animal layer is a huge diversity of animal types. And I'm just going to run through a few of those invertebrate species to, to familiarize you with them today. Dominant here are, are soft corals in these pictures. And there's a lot of these related species in a group that's known as Cnidaria. Um, but it doesn't matter too much. Um, but it includes the co corals, soft corals, anemones, jellyfish, that sort of thing. Um, there's a great diversity and a real richness of color of anemone life. In the UK, we've got a sea lock anemone top left here. Um, there's a, um, um, a, some dahlia anemones um, and a jewel anemone. Um, different anemones specialized around the country, but often really, really, really colorful species. Out in the water column, we have some, you know, incredible um, jellyfish um, and all around the UK, particularly in the summer months, the seas can be full of these spectacular jellyfish blooms, um, sometimes in large numbers. Then you'll go days and days and the sea will be empty of jellyfish. And then again, you'll see loads again, just living in a patchy distribution in the open ocean, filtering particles out of the ocean and living a drifting existence. These are moon jellies on the left and a um, lion's mane jellyfish on the right. There are many, many invertebrate species, and I can't cover them all, so I'm just going to cover sort of some, a few mollusks from one of the main groups, a few crustaceans, another of the main groups, and a few of the echinoderms, another of the main groups. The mollusks, I would think everyone who's ever been to the um, beach will have seen some of our marine mollusks, you know, relatives of the slugs and snails that we have in, in our garden. Um, and you'll have seen the, the herbivorous um Limpets living on the rocks in um, on many a beach, exposed at, at low tide, but when the sea comes in, so they, they, they no longer stay still and begin to wander around over these rocks, hoovering up the layers of algae growing on them. There's a real richness, particularly in soft sediments of, of mollusk life, particularly bivalves. A lot of the, the bivalves, the, the clamshells and, and various, these are razor shells washed up on a beach in Norfolk. Um, but these live in, in some of the soft sediments in incredible densities, um, living in the sediment and filtering l food out of the water that washes above them. Under the water, we, we, we can encounter these bivalves as well. This is a queen scallop, one of the two scallop species um, that those that, that eat seafood, I'm sure, are very familiar with. Um, and this is a queen scallop here um, up in Scotland on a sea lock. And it's it's got its mouth open. It's It's sucking water into its 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 mantle area inside its shell and f sifting out those particles and, and and growing that way it's actually got hundreds of eyes around the edge of the shell you can probably see in this picture here i think my one of my favorite types of mollusks though in the uk are the sea slugs and the sea slugs are incredibly attractive a lot of them rich strong colors and the reason they have these colors is not for their own amusements it, most of them have very basic eyes or no eyes at all these colors are there to, are to warm potential predators that sea slugs are not good eating. Many of them have sort of toxic and distasteful chemicals in their bodies. Um, others, actually, they feed on stinging hydroids like the one on the left here, which is a Fjordia and lineata. Um, and they, they feed on those stinging hydroids. And rather than getting stung by their food themselves, they're actually able to reuse the stings from their food and secrete them along their back in those those long spiky things you can see growing out of its back. Um, those actually are then packed full of the stings of their food and and they, they help protect the sea slug itself. And that's why they have the bright colors to advertise it. It's a little bit like a sheep, I guess, eating stinging nettles and ending up with wool that would sting you if you touched it. A great defense if you're able to do it. Um, we're, very, we're very lucky. There's a huge diversity of, of sea slugs in the UK, and many of them are very, very pretty. We have more than 120 species of different types, and we can see them all around our coasts pretty much throughout the whole year. There's often a, a bit of a boom of them in the springtime, but throughout the year, really, we can enjoy seeing, seeing sea slugs underwater, sometimes in rock pools, but more normally snorkeling or diving. Um, they're relatively small, most of them, you know, sort of, you know, this sort of size or and even smaller but once you get your eye in they're relatively easy to find their bright colors make them stand out there are plenty of other mollusk species but the the cephalopods the cephalopods are a real favorite of mine this is a little cuttle um uh, photographed at night 
down in, 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 in Devon, in the South Hams in Devon. Um, and this is another type of small cuttlefish, fishes of Rossia up in the sea locks in Scotland, a little bit bigger, um, but another bobtail squid um, working its way over this, over this soft um, sand seabed. I think my favourite of our cuttlefish in the UK are the 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 common cuttlefish, the, the the really big impressive cuttlefish that we generally find along the south coast. They're kind of a warmer water species that come up to our south coast and they breed in sheltered bays all along the south coast in the late spring. Um, and these grow really large. They're actually quite short-lived animals. They only live a couple of years, but in that time they grow incredibly quickly and they can reach about um, about I think about about a uh, about 10 kilos in weight about 60 centimeters long the big ones so really really big they're also very intelligent animals and when they test them in, in the laboratory they find that they're they're able to, to to perform tasks um and they have the ability um to sell of, of self-control there was an experiment published last year where scientists taught the cuttlefish that if they didn't take the small amount of food initially they would get a bigger treat after a, after a delay. And that ability to self-control is not something that is common at all amongst animals and shows a real high level of, of intelligence. I think the thing that I love about watching the cuttlefish when they come in is that they have a really elaborate mating and display behavior. Um, and, you know, those who are familiar with the, you know, some of the, the Jurassic marine life, you know, you can imagine that, Things like ammonites probably had quite similar behaviours with males competing for females uh, and guarding them throughout. Um, so the way the way that a lot of mollusks spawn, and, and particularly um, in the cuttlefish, is that the males pass a bag of sperm to the females. And therefore, they need to guard the female as she slowly lays eggs. Otherwise, they can't guarantee that they're going to be, the males can't guarantee that they will be the father of those young because the female could, could get rid of that bag of sperm and get a, a new bag of sperm. Um, so here you've got two male cuttlefish flaring these stripes, actually even flaring their eyes open at each other to look as big and as impressive as possible as, they, as, as the one in the middle guards the smaller female behind as she slowly lays egg, eggs in amongst the seaweed. On to the crustaceans, another fascinating group of marine life. We have a huge number of crustaceans in, in the sea. This is one of the more familiar ones. I'm sure many of you know this. It's um, known as an edible crab or a brown crab or a, um, a pie crab, sometimes pie crust pack crab. They look a little bit like a pie or a Cornish pasty from the top. Um, and this is our most caught crabs. If you have crab sandwiches, it's, it's very often this species we catch about um, 10,000 tons in the English Channel of edible crabs each year. Um, and um, But they're, they're fascinating creatures. They're big and bulky. They've got these huge sort of Popeye arms. This one isn't a particularly large one. But when they get really big, they have huge, huge arms on them. Um, really um, impressive beasts. Um, actually, down this, is, this, this picture here is taken in, in Norfolk. And in Norfolk, where the crabs live on the chalk beds, they're known as chroma crabs. So it's the same species, but in that area, when they feed on the chalk, they're thought to have a, a superior flavour. And that's why they're, they're sold as, 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 as chroma crabs um, from the fishing port of Chroma out, out, out in Norfolk. And these two in Norfolk. They have a slightly different colour over there as well, but very much the same species. Another common crab we'll see underwater is the swimming crab. Um, and these are always full of antics. This particular one here... Um, this is taken up in, in the far northwest of Scotland in Sutherland. Um, and this one here is actually eating another crab. Um, but they're, they're scavengers. They're quite um, voracious, quite fast moving crabs. Got these beady red eyes, um, the swimming crabs. Here it's in amongst all these um, sea squirts. Um, this is a, a, a fascinating little crab. This is um, th 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 this crab here has got um, uses its antenna as a snorkel. So the picture on the on the left shows it up out of the water, um, and the picture above me on on, on the right, um, that's actually where it's buried itself underwater. But it's still got those long antenna sticking up through the sand, and that allows it to suck clean water down into the under the sand and provide it with with fresh oxygenated water to to keep it alive. So it's a bit like us using a snorkel under the water. Um, this one here is actually using kind of this snorkel to to suck down seawater down when it's living and hiding away underneath the sand. 
And these long-legged spider crabs, there's a few species of these around the, around the country. Um, these, these are really interesting smaller crabs, often live associated with other invertebrate life. The one on the left is taken in Celsi in West Sussex. Um, and that one there was living with this um, snake locks anemone. Um, and, and these um, decorate their bodies to, as, as a kind of camouflage protection, sticking this orange sponge on them particularly, but other materials as well. So it kind of bulks them up a little bit as well, but helps camouflage them too. There are actually two crabs in the picture on the left. Um, there's, there's the main one, and then just below the, the left-hand arm on the right side of, of the crab, you can see the head of another one. The bigger spider crabs that we see um, in in on the south coast are these 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 these, these fantastic beasts. Um, these have actually kind of been renamed by the fishing industry in, in in the last year as a Cornish king crab, but it's still the old classic spider crab, um, and um, really you know quite a large, very impressive, very colourful crab. Um, you see them you know wandering around um, on the seabed. Very impressive to see underwater kind of, you know, this kind of size, really, really nice and impressive. And then in the summer months, um, we occasionally can find them in aggregations. And these aggregations is where all the crabs in one area gather up together. And that's the time that they molt. One of the issues that crustaceans have is they have exoskeletons, which are great for protection, but they stop you growing. So when the crab wants to grow more, it needs to shed its exoskeleton and come out afresh from inside, and then it can swell up and grow to the next stage. So crabs kind of grow in, in, in steps as they grow, growing about 20% each time they, they shed an exoskeleton and come out. But when they shed that exoskeleton, they obviously have lost their armor. And so to keep them protected when they're molting, they gather together in, in large numbers. And I think that, that those large numbers offer them some protection. It may also help mates come together as well. Um, but it's particularly, I think, thought to, to help them for protection. This is at Burton Bradstock, so endorse it as well. Up in the north, we get a different species of spider crabs. Uh, these are the more northern spider crabs. They're called sea toads in Scotland. There's a couple of species of those. You can see this one's living on a brittle star bed with that colour on the bottom of the picture below. Um, and, and these also got these long sort of spidery um, legs and big claws out the front. This is a, a different, the other species of, of, of sea toad. This one here is climbing around on dead man's fingers, the, the soft corals that we saw lots of earlier on. There's a whole range of different um, crustacean life. It's a really diverse group underwater, and many of our best characters in the underwater world come from this group. These are long clawed squat lobsters. You can see a, a bunch of them living in a crevice in a sea lock on the left. And the one on the right is actually taking up refuge in an old bottle, using that as a, a protect, protect, um, protective burrow. And they've got these long kind of, um, a bit like, um, I always think they're a bit like they're holding chopsticks on each side um, on their claws on the right. When they're young, they're really pretty, this species. Um, they've got really intense color. A lot of their white coloration hasn't started taking over their body. And they're really, really attractive um, creatures. A recogn very recognisable species are the hermit crabs. We have quite a few species of hermit crabs in, in British seas, and we can find them all the way from, from on the beach, and particularly around rock pools, down to, to pretty much every dive site that we, we visit, um, as long as there's really a supply of, of, of mollusk shells for them to, to take up home in. Um, hermit crabs, rather than having a strong, heavy exoskeleton of themselves, actually protect themselves by living inside the shells of other animals, particularly mollusks, such as, as periwinkles and whelks and, and that sort of thing. Um, this one's shell has actually been overgrown by a sponge. So he has got a, a mollusk shell in there somewhere, but the, the shell itself has got this orange sponge growing over the top of it, um, creating really quite a, an unusual house, um, certainly one of the prettier hermit crab shells is. And hermit crabs are, are scavengers and, and, and hunters of particularly mollusks and, and bivalves like this. This one here is fe feeding on a flame shell. Um, which is a rather pretty and unusual species of, of, of bivalve mollusk that lives in the underwater world. And this one has, has grabbed the flame shell and was ripping the flesh and munching it up um, as it moved around inside the kelp forest. One of my favourite crustaceans are, is the lobster. Um, and you can see a, a, a large um, blue coloured common lobster at the bottom of this picture. Um, there are two types of lobsters in the UK. Um, 
the ones that many people are familiar with eating lobster and they're, they're not blue when they cook because they're, they're, they're carapace, their their body goes red when they're cooked, but they're, they're, they're blue or grayish blue in, in life. Um, the other type of lobster that we have in the UK is the, the spiny lobster, which doesn't have the big claws, but has very long antenna, which it uses for its defense. And actually this one here was waving its antenna towards me um, to, to keep it protected. These are actually something of a conservation success story in recent years. Um, these were hunted in really large numbers, particularly by divers, but also by fishing. Um, and sort of back in the 70s and 80s, we hunted them pretty much to local extinction around most of the UK. And you never really saw them underwater. But since about 2014, their numbers have been really rising well, and particularly down in, in Devon and Cornwall. This picture here was taken down in Cornwall. Um, their numbers are really bouncing back, and they're now really a common sight. And it's a real change that I've seen during, during my diving career is a species that I never, ever saw. And now when you dive in that area particularly, you see them just about on every dive. And so it does show that when we do give species a chance, they really can have the power to bounce back. There were many fantastic shrimps living in our seas. On the left here is a brown shrimp, and on the right it's a, a pink shrimp. Um, both of these are taken up in Scotland. Um, but yeah, very varied in, in colour and style. Um, but there are some you know, spectacular species. This is a very rarely seen species of shrimp. This is a crinoid shrimp or a feather star shrimp that lives specifically amongst the branches of the, the feather stars and, and um, hard seen by very few people. So we don't really have a, a good idea of its distribution. But strangely, this species is seen in the Adriatic in the Mediterranean a lot. And then occasionally also in Scotland. Um, and quite what's going on in between those two places, no one's really sure. Another beautiful shrimp is this, which is the snake locks anemone shrimp. And this one was photographed in Swanage. And this is the picture that I took about an hour after leaving the, the Etches collection. Um, it was actually last summer. Um, and I was actually looking at one of the shrimps in fossilized form um, in the collection. It's a beautiful shrimp fossil, if you, if you know the collection well. And I remember saying um, to Steve, who I was going around with at the time, you know, I'm, I'm just off to, to go and look for these beautiful shrimps. And at that time, um, the, there weren't many shrimps under the, the, the pier. They kind of recruited in later that summer. So there was just this one shrimp and I'd found him on my previous visit. So I was going back to to get a photo of him. And I'm pleased to say I did. And here he is in the talk. There are plenty of other crustaceans. These are isopods, relatives of the wood lice that we, we have in our garden, but coming in a whole range of, of different shapes and forms. And these are amphipods. These are both the same same species of northern amphipod, a very beautiful, small coloured little bug that we find up in, in northern Scotland in particular. Um, in, in the, it seems to be more of a colder water species. It's actually one of the great things about exploring British seas is that the life changes quite a lot from north to south. There are species that we find all around the UK coast. Um, but there are other species that are very much southern in their distribution. And we, the UK kind of marks the northern end of their, their range. And there are other species that are more northern. And the UK marks the southern end of their range. So as you dive and explore rock pool around different parts of the UK, so you get to see different specialized species in those areas. Um, and it's definitely one of the treats of, of, of traveling the country and, and exploring the underwater world. Just briefly, a little bit more on the invertebrates. The final final group I was going to look at today are the echinoderms. Um, probably most familiar as starfish, or in this case, brittle stars um, that live. These live in, in large numbers. Again, I said as I said before, brittle stars, you can find them on their own, but they often like to live in these brittle star beds. It allows them to live in areas of strong current. And then when the currents are running too strongly, they can intertwine their arms and kind of hold themselves down as a mat on the seabed. Another type of the echinoderms are the sea cucumbers. Some sea cucumbers move around. These ones um, here live buried in the sand, just extending their front end and their mouth parts to filter food from the, the water column. This is a detail of a, um, a, a sun star. Um, one of the, again, another one of the northern species. This one's taken up in Scotland. Um, and you can see the detail of its of the surface of the of, the, of its body um, with gills and, and 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 other processes on the surface. One of the things that's really interesting about all the echinoderms is they have a, a hydrostatic system in their bodies. 
Um, and so that they, they perform a lot of their functions with this very unusual hydrostatic system that allows them to, to pu push fluid into different parts of their body and, and give them uh, unusual um, capabilities. This gives quite a good example of the, these are the tube feet, which are the hydrostatic feet um, coming out of a common sea urchin. And it uses these to, to capture um, food as well, but they also use these for locomotion just with thousands and thousands of these small feet slowly moving their way um, across the seabed. The, the urchins, as I said earlier, they're, they're one of the major grazers, the major herbivores of our underwater world. And you can see this one here has got plenty of kelp to be, to be getting on with. And the way life works underwater is when these sea urchins die, their, their shells, their hard shells, don't go to waste. So you may have, have seen some fossils in the etches collection of, of, of sea urchins, and many of the fossils there actually show them in life, and you can see them with spines coming off. Um, but where they're not preserved like that, they, you know, the sea urchins, when they die, um, their shells don't go to waste. And this is a two-spot goby that's actually using this sea urchin shell as a, a nest, as a house to raise, to, to lay its eggs and allow them to, to grow without risking them being, being eaten by, by, by potential predators. So this is the female here. And if you look here, you can actually see both the male and the female staring out from their hole inside this sea urchin shell. To, the gobies can't always find themselves a, um, a natural place to hide, but they'll make use of any material. This is actually back down in Dorset now under Swanage Pier. I think this is actually the end of an old um, post from the pier that's fallen into the water. And now the, the goby is making use of it, as making use of the whole of it as a hiding hole and potentially maybe with eggs inside. One of my favorite um, parental care stories from British seas is with the lump sucker. And the, the pretty fish on the, the left of the lump suckers are not necessarily pretty, but the colorful fish on the left, this is a male lump sucker. And he's one of the great parents of the underwater world. He'll, the female, which is the fish on the right, will come into shallow water, lay her eggs, the male will fertilize them. The female will then swim off into deep water again and into deeper water. And the male will stay with those eggs in the shallows for more than a month while they slowly develop until they hatch. Um, when they hatch out, they, they, you, you, you'll, you'll see all these, um, well, a few months later when they, the young come back into shore again, um, you'll see baby lump suckers on the kelp sometimes, a little red one here in, from Shetland Islands on the left and a, a sort of a medium sized one on the right. You can see this one here is already starting to grow some of the, um, the scoots along its, its side that, that mark it out as, an ad, as, it, as it's becoming more mature. So the one on the left is probably thumb size or the end of your thumb size. The one on the right is probably fist size um, as it grows up. At times we get great um, arrivals of large numbers of fish underwater, but I, I, I was keen, um, and, and some of these silvery fish can be really spectacular, but I was keen to point in this talk towards some of the more colorful inhabitants of our seas. Um, and there are many examples of that. I think people think that a lot of the fish in our seas are drab and not as exciting as the species that we may find in, in tropical waters. But that, that's really not the case, particularly during mating season. A lot of the, the, the fish were really flushed with color. These are two male wrasses of different species. There's a, a cuckoo wrass on the left and a, a, um, a ballon rice wrasse on the right. Um, the cuckoo wrasse is down in Cornwall. The ballon wrasse is up in north, northeast um, in Northumbria. Um, and really, really pretty fish. Um, these fish will have also started their lives off as, as female fish. And it's quite common in fish that, that there is sex changes through their, their lives. And, and often they have this terminal male phase. This, their final phase is male. So they'll, they'll grow as females. You have Therefore, you have most of the population producing eggs. And then the biggest fish get to become males. So you have the very strongest, biggest, healthiest fish passing on their genes to the to the next generation. So it's quite a good system that, that promotes the the strongest fish as, as parents and has the majority of the population contributing the hard work of, of, of creating eggs. I think one of my favorite groups of fish that I couldn't leave out of this talk are the, the blennies. And this is our biggest blenny species, the Tompot blenny. This one taken here in Dorset, um, here swimming through, through seaweed. Very characterful fish, um, full of, of, of charisma um, and really pretty in places. The Tompot Brenny has got this lovely red explosion of Siri above its eye. Um, really, really 
interesting fish, very characterful. Um, guard, you know, they're territorial. They'll fight with each other, guard their eggs through the summer. You can find them in rock pools sometimes, um, but more typically snorkeling or diving, um, we see them. Um, they really like on shipwrecks, anywhere where there's lots of cracks and crevices for them to live in. In the north, we, we, we have another species of blenny that's a little bit similar looking. It's got that same kind of tuft on its head um, and um, is, is, is really um, impressive to, to see up there. Um, and here, this one here, you can see it's living um, in, a, in a crack amongst this pink coralline algae. All around our coast, there's many different species of blennies. The, the one on the left here, um, that's a variable blenny. That's a species that's only really been seen in the UK over about the last 10 years. It's a southern species that's distribution is slowly moving north. And it was you know, known from the French coast, but now we're starting to see it on the south coast of, of the UK. And there's established breeding populations. And maybe as our seas get slowly warmer with, with global warming, um, so this species might spread further and further north. Um, the one on the right is a, a very is, is actually known as the, the common blenny or the shanny. It's a very it's a shallow water specialist. Really likes the intertidal zone. It's the most common fish that you see in rock pools, um, but it's quite hard to spot because it's very well camouflaged. This is a shanny here, photographed kind of from a more normal angle, and you can see how well its coloration disguises it amongst the barnacles that that often coat the rocks in that intertidal zone where it favours to live. This fish can actually survive um, really for quite a long time out of the water um, and can survive being dried, you know, being being exposed at low tide. Um, and they're really, really remarkable little creatures. But if you find fish rock pooling, they're, they're very often shannies. There are some uh, other amazing fish in our seas. This one here is a sunfish. It's the largest bony fish in the sea. So if you don't count sharks, um, um, basically, this is the largest fish you'll see. They're very, very heavy um, as adults, and they can produce a, a really large female can produce 300 million eggs. So they're really bizarre biology. They're a fish with with no proper tail. They swim with their um, dorsal and anal fins wafting up and down like this as they swim through the water. Really bizarre fish. Um, often they, they they're feeding on jellyfish and things like that. So really unusual fish, but quite common a little bit out from the coast. If you go out for a trip on the ocean um, in the summer on a calm day, you'll quite often see there's a good chance of seeing these. Harder to see them underwater, but from the surface, they're quite commonly seen from boats. Another bizarre looking beastie. This is a, a John Dory, um, which I always thought of as a, very much a southern species as well. Although when I was in Scotland last week, we actually had one right up in the north of Scotland. Um, up there, this one here is, is, is photographed in Cornwall. Um, this fish is a, is a hunter and it's very, very, very laterally compressed. It's a tall, thin fish. And although it stands out a lot like this, when they turn head on to you, they're about the same thickness as these strands of, of mermaid tresses, these, this seaweed, and they just disappear into this environment. So they're a very effective hunter in this environment using their, their unusual body shape and the fact that they can suddenly disappear when they almost when they go head on really makes them effective predators full of character definitely one of my favorite fish species another effective hunter um, that uses a very different strategy and is squashed in the other direction is the anglerfish or monkfish this is a large fish eating predator you can see those those ever watchful eyes that mouth full of big teeth and they actually have a fishing lure on them that allows them to to, to to attract fish towards them, and then they, they ambush, predi um, ambush their prey. And another bizarre one, this is a snailfish. It was photographed up in, in Scotland, in Shetland actually, and it's a tiny little fish, um, um, very poorly known, and lives a very secretive life, often just attached to the seabed, but I thought it was just such a weirdo. We have some real you know, diversity in shapes and, and, and sizes. This is a broad-nosed um, pipefish. And, and seahorse as well. It's just short snout pipe, uh, short snout seahorse um, here. The south coast is actually the best place for seahorses, but they are very rare. I've not seen one for more than 10 years. Um, but when you do get the chance to see the one, you know, it is obviously very special. Um, and there are places, you know, where you have a chance. But I would say generally, you know, I go diving and photographing in the ocean a lot. And it's been 10 years since I've seen one. So they're not an easy thing to find. 
Another species that loves being in amongst the weed are the sticklebacks. This is a um, sea stickleback. And it's actually, this is a fish that builds a nest. And just below this male here is his nest. And he's created a nest by wrapping weed together. And then uh, the females laid eggs in there and he's fertilized them. And then he's guarding them through the spring, waiting for them to hatch. We don't tend to see a lot of, of, of the reproductive patterns of, of fish in our seas, but they're, um, when we do it, it's, it's a great opportunity. These are a pair of dragonets spawning. And the larger fish here is a male and the smaller fish here is the female. And they're on a spawning rise where they've left the seabed where they live. And they're coming up together into the water column to release their sperm and eggs. Um, we do have plenty of shark species in, in British seas. Um, although we don't tend to see them very much. They're not very commonly seen by divers. The most commonly seen one is the small spotted cat shark, which is also known as a dogfish, kind of confusingly. Um, and this is a pair of them here up in the Shetland Islands. Um, and the, perhaps the most spectacular is the, the, that, the basking shark. This is in the, um, the Hebrides in, in Scotland. And these are plankton feeding sharks. So they're very big, but they swim when they're feeding with their mouths open and they push that mouth through the water like a big net and just hoover up all the plankton and the, the wastewater comes out through the big gills on their side um, as they, they fill their bellies with plankton. Um, one of the most popular of um, the British marine species um, for photographers to try and see are blue sharks. And we can see them all along the, the Atlantic coast. Um, so, you know, off Cornwall, off West Wales, we um, particularly we have the chance to see blue sharks just going out a little bit from the coast um, and, and hoping to get encounters also up the channel a little bit towards um, um, Cornwall and Devon. We get the chance to see them as well. Um, and this is this one here was off Penzance out, out in the blue. Very elegant shark, quite a curious shark. Got this beautiful big eye, lovely blue coloration. Um, these sharks actually migrate over huge distances. So although they they come to British waters in the summertime, this same shark will probably end up maybe as far away as the Caribbean in the winter months, um, really moving across that area. Sadly, blue sharks are one of the most fished species of sharks in the world, and we catch huge numbers of them every, every year. Um, not, not so much in the UK, but in other countries. And they do occasionally turn up in fishmongers and, and supermarkets here in the UK. And just to finish up my 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 tour of the the different species i'll finish off with a, a couple of, 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 of marine mammals and and, and just a, one bird species this is a gray seal um seeing seals i think is definitely one of the diving highlights of the underwater world this is in the the hebrides in scotland um this is a common seal so we have two species of seals in the uk the uk is really important for both species we have about 20 percent of the the world's population of common seals and about 50 percent of the world's population of gray seals. And the UK is definitely the best place in the world to dive with gray seals. There's several places around the country where the seals are, are used to people being in the water and the seals really, really in, clearly enjoy those interactions. And will you, if you go diving in that area, every now and again, a seal is just gonna pop up in front of your face and want you to, to interact with it. And you don't get any choice in the matter because the seal can swim 10 times faster than you. And so he's round, round behind you, pulling on your fins. You turn around and he's hidden again and he's popping up. And they think it's the best fun ever. Um, and actually, to be honest, as divers, we do too. They're, 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 they're fantastic um, species to see and very relaxed in the water, really masters their environment. If you've seen seals on the beach, they're usually very wary, um, can be aggressive, always best to give them a lot of space. In the water, they're at home. That's the world that they're used to. And... You know, you don't have any choice about how much space they give you. Um, they, they're coming in and they want to play a lot of the time. Um, but to finish off with, I, I just sort of remind us that the sea in the UK doesn't just support the animals that spend all their time there. It's also very important for a lot of our favorite wildlife that we see on land. And a, a, a species that I always love to see is the puffin. Um, and puffins, although they come to land to nest, they're very much ocean birds. They're, although they're about the size of a lot of our garden birds, they're actually much, much more long lived. You know, a, uh, a robin might live a couple of years, a, a blackbird might live four years, but puffins regularly live to about 20 years of age. So they're much longer lived birds returning to their same breeding colonies every year. And it's why they, they really suffer 
if we don't look after our, our, our coastal environment. You can see there's one here has got his mouth full of sand eels. You know, that's their preferred food. They're, they're diving into the water, hunting these, these, these sand eels, particularly for food, and they can end up with lots of them caught in there. So while tonight's talk was, or today's talk was predominantly about the marine life under the water, many of our favorite coastal species are just as reliant on us having healthy seas as those above the water. So I, I you know, really encourage you to remember that next time you're enjoying seeing seabirds on the cliffs or a you know, colony of, 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 of seals on, on the rocks, remember that these are animals that, that love the underwater world. And puffins, when you see them under the water, you realize that actually they're brilliantly adapted to that world, swimming with all the speed and agility of a penguin when they're in the water, um, and fantastic hunters and exploiters of our amazing British seas. So I hope you enjoyed that tour through some of my favorite species, some of the amazing marine life of modern British seas. <laughs>